Welcome to Unlocked. I'm so excited for today, y'all, because I have my mom on and just my mom. We did the whole Chrisley crossover thing and she and my dad and sister were on, but today we have just mom and I'm so excited because our conversations are definitely different when it's just you and I versus when dad's involved or anyone else. Absolutely. Thank you for having me. You're welcome. See, we all, their podcast, Chrisley Confessions, is so fun. It's also very different, I think, for, than how I'm doing my podcast. Right. And y'all discuss all of everything you've got going on in your life right now. But today, first off, we want to bring awareness to Breast Cancer Awareness Month. Yes, October. That's why I have my pink on. Yes, mom has her pink on because you were diagnosed with breast cancer in March of 2012. So mm -hmm. I am a 10-year survivor. That is crazy. Um, yes, and I have had the privilege to talk to so many people because I've shared my story. Mm -hmm. I shared my story on Chrisley Knows Best. Um, I've shared my story on the podcast and just with anybody. Um, and so I, um, I actually, I love to be able to do that actually. And so your journey to that, because I did, I posted a thing on social media and asked people to ask questions. And one of the things they asked was about your journey with breast cancer, how you found out about it. So, um, I had, first of all, no family history, which I want everyone to know. Most breast cancers are not hereditary. So, um, I had no family history. I was in the shower one day and your dad literally opened the shower door. We had two doors, door on each side. And he said, you need to go have a mammogram. And I said, what? He's like, you need to go have a mammogram. And yeah. I said, well, I'm, I don't have any family history. I, you know, I had checked myself. I'd not, you know, did a self breast exam. I'm like, what do you mean? He's like, Something tells me that you need to have a mammogram. So I called my doctor. I said, I need to get a mammogram. She said, oh, did you, you know, have you felt something? And I said, no, but Todd says I need to have a mammogram. She's like, well, you know, I'm not sure that your insurance is going to cover it because you're not 40 yet. And, you know, you don't have any family history and you haven't found anything. I said, well, just, I need to get an appointment and I'll just have to pay for it. So um, I went and... You know, I didn't think anything about it. I actually no. left a um, a business meeting that he and I were having. And I said, you know what? I'll just run, do this, and then you pick the kids up from school. So that was the plan. Um, I had the mammogram. And, well, I remember that day dad picking us up from school, which I knew dad never picked us up from school. That just was not the thing. Like, Y'all had your duties. Yours was to take us and pick us up from school. That's what we were used to. That's what we were comfortable with. Right. And you always, like, you were not really that fun parent that was like, oh, you don't have to go to school or you can get out early or whatever. Anytime dad had to take us, we got to school late. And, or if he, this time, he picked us up. And I remember getting checked out of school early. <clears throat> and I knew, I was like, okay, something's wrong because that never happens. And I remember walking outside and just the moment I saw him, we looked at each other, he just started bawling. Yeah. It was weird because, um, you know, they're not really supposed to like tell you right then. It's supposed to be, you know, like read by the radiologist and then whatever. And I knew, like I knew that it was. Um, so I went to Johns Hopkins. I was diagnosed on, I think it was like March 3rd uh, or March 5th. And by the 21st of March, I was on a table getting a double mastectomy. Yeah. Um, that was my choice. They said that I could have possibly had a lumpectomy, but for me, and I'm saying this, I am not a medical professional, do not claim to be one, but for me, the right choice was to have the double mastectomy because mm -hmm. everything that we read, when there was, you know, a reoccurrence, your chances were a lot higher after a lumpectomy yeah. than a double mastectomy. And keep in mind, Grayson at the time was almost, what, five and a half, almost yeah, six years he old. he was a baby. So I was like, I have to do whatever I can do to stay alive for these children. Like, yeah. 
no, I can't, you know, and I will, you know, I'll never forget. And, and it, I never even thought twice after that. After we made that, I made that decision and your dad, of course, was on board 100%. I never thought about it again. And I'm so glad that I did because after I got, after they got in there, I actually had two tumors and not one. And they said, you know, it would have been very hard to have gotten clear margins. And, and they said that if you would have waited because you were 39 at the time and they said, if you would have waited until you were 40, yeah, it, it would have been maintenance of life, right? It would have been a whole different situation. And Mm -hmm. that's why, you know, I urge people that if you do have that feeling or if you, you know, especially if you're doing self breast exams and you feel something, you go to the doctor. I don't care how old you are. You have to be your own medical advocate because, you know, they will just push you down the line or, or put you off or whatever, you know, insurance says. Um, so I did, I had a double mastectomy, um, You know, it was so crazy because they didn't know if I was going to have to do chemo or not. Mm -hmm. And one of the weirdest things as it's, it's like, I was okay having a double mastectomy. I was okay having my breasts removed, but I was like, I don't know that I can do my breasts removed and lose my hair too. And that sounds so crazy to think about. Um, so I'll never forget. I knew that I wouldn't know until I woke up because they would check my lymph nodes. And if there was any lymph node involvement, then I would have to do chemo. Yeah. I knew that I was guaranteed chemo if there was lymph node involvement. So I'll never forget when I woke up, your dad was right there. And I remember asking, I was like, is it in my lymph nodes? And he said, no, they're clear. So yeah. I knew my chances were lower of me having to um, have chemo. And so and, I will, and I'll say I now as an adult I can see things at a much deeper level I think but I have said that because you know at first you were they said they found the lumps and then they wanted to go and do a biopsy mm-hmm. and we were at Northside Hospital and I remember sitting outside of the building we were at and there was like a little drive under and then on the other side there was a fountain right there and I was sitting there at that fountain and dad walks up to me while you were in your uh having that biopsy done and he just breaks down and literally like fell into my arms crying and I say that was the first time in my life like I always knew you and dad loved each other that wasn't a question but I didn't understand the depth of it until that moment right so I say if it wasn't for that moment, I don't know because it's so easy to say I love someone. Right. But you truly see it's and it's sad that it takes you almost having to lose someone to see how much you love them. Right. But I think for me, that was the first time that I actually registered at 15 that, oh, wow, dad really loves her. Well, and I do think it was a um, it was a turning point in our relationship. Because anybody who knows Todd Chrisley knows that he is, he is a very visual person. You know, he, that's just who he is. And I can remember we were at the hotel there in, at Johns Hopkins. Um, and I knew that I had to have a shower, Mm -hmm. but I knew I couldn't do it by myself. And I was terrified of him seeing me because even though I didn't have, I did have some reconstruction at the time, but it wasn't anything that you wanted to see, you know, and you had the drains and you had all this stuff. And I was like, what am I going to do? Like, I can't, you know, I can't have him see me like this. Mm -hmm. But the thing that you don't realize is that everything is connected. So you can't raise your hands above your, above your head to wash your hair. And I'll never forget, he he said, okay, it's time, it's time to get your shower. And I paused, I was like, you know, I'm okay, I'm okay, maybe I'll wait another day. He's like, no, we're going to get your shower and I'm going to dry your hair for you. And I remember getting in that shower and he never flinched. Mm-hmm. This is somebody who visually can... He passed out when you had Gray. <laughs> right. He passed out when I delivered my... Grayson, right. Or, no, I think it was Chase. 
it was Chase, but he is such a visual person. And when I tell you that he never flinch like he is a person that can see blood and pass out or see something and throw up he did he kept track of my drains he changed them he emptied them he wrote everything down he helped me get a shower never one time did he make me feel less than and I think there's so many women that deal with that you know it's a it's a it's a and, and men too you know um because we have as a society put all this emphasis on all this emphasis on, oh, these boobs and, you know, what, how sexualizing, you know, making them be and all yeah. this. And it really was a turning point in our relationship because it, it truly made our relationship stronger. Um, and, and, so it's, think- and it's so, I, and, and I almost at times I feel not guilty for saying that because I feel like I'm blessed and God's blessed me with my, my marriage, but so many marriages don't survive it. Mm. And that to me is heartbreaking. Um, and I, you know, and I, so many people don't have the same result that I had, you know, I am, thank God 10 years and I'm cancer free. You know, I will never forget that Grayson was a, kindergarten and the the secretary it was a few months after it was right before the end of school I'll never forget so it had to be like May yeah. or April or May she she looks at me and she says um how are you doing and I'm good I'm doing great she said I want you to call someone she said I just want you to call this person she has two boys that go to school here and our, you have handled having breast cancer and your recovery so well and I really think you could help her and I called her and it was my friend Lisa Bowling and she actually was either on her way to the doctor or on her way back from the doctor she was diagnosed one month after me Mm -hmm. and she passed away and left two little boys yeah so there are so many people that don't have the result that I have. And I thank God every day. I do not take my health for granted. Um, but you know, one in eight women are diagnosed with breast cancer in their life. And so it's something that we have to keep talking about. We have to keep focusing on because I don't know of anybody who doesn't know somebody that knows somebody that it's, that it's affected. 100%. And you've been good with me about going and I was freaking out and then it ended up being nothing, but it's all about, it's better to be safe. Absolutely. We have people all the time. We've got people that we have worked with and that we're, you're friends with, that I'm friends with, you know, and I'm like, Mm -hmm. get that mammogram. If you feel something, it doesn't feel right to you. Go have it checked yeah. because you never, ever know. And it's yeah. so rampant now. Yeah. I mean, it's crazy. And to going back to what you said about dad, when, you know, he was helping you and how it just brought you to a different level in your relationship with him. It's kind of one of those things that it's, I think you knew that he loved you. Right. But not until that moment did you understand the depth of it. Because as a woman, you're always looking at all these other women out here and you compare yourself and you do all these things. Absolutely. And we're our own worst enemies sometimes. Someone can love you so much, but you're still in your mind thinking, oh, they could find someone that's got this or that or that's what? younger, that's thinner, that's prettier, that's whatever. Yeah. Absolutely. And and those thoughts go through your head, you know, that here I am, thirty nine years old. You know, and I'm I'm having a double mastectomy, and you know, and I think there's this um, this misnomer that people think that okay, well, you know, I'm gonna have a double mastectomy, and then I'm gonna come out, and you know, I'm gonna look like a Victoria's Secret model. Yeah, no, that's just not reality. Yeah. That is just not reality. People think, oh, well, then I'll get the boobs that I never had or whatever. It's not reality. When you remove all your breast tissue, your breasts do not look like somebody who just gets implants. And I think every woman should have 
their choice, whether you want reconstruction, whether you don't, it is up to you completely 100%. -hmm. And for me, I wanted the reconstruction. I did the reconstruction and, um, you know, I've had a revision and, you know, and I'm grateful that that has happened, uh, and that I was able to do that. Um, but it's just, um, you know, there's just so much more to it than just, you know. Yeah, no, for sure. And I think during that time too, because part of the question was also how like your children handled it during that time. And I think for me, I truly saw what it was to be a great mom. Like never once did you, I mean, we, I remember, I think you still had drains in or something and we went on spring break and we all were like, no, we're fine. We don't have yeah. to go. And no, that you, was, that was something that I, I set uh, for myself. We had already had a trip plan down to Florida for spring break. And I said, I'm going to do that. Well, this was like March 23rd when I had my double mastectomy. Yeah. So it was like 10 days later that this was happening. And I was like, no, I am going to do it. I, if it kills me, I'm going to do it. I want my kids to have as normal a life as possible. This is a trip that we had planned. And yeah, it was rough because I did. I still had drains. I mean, I couldn't do anything but be there. Um, but I wanted to give you guys mm-hmm. that normalcy as, as much as I could. Yeah, and I think, too, that's just part of, I don't know, the amount of respect that I have for you for always. It's always us first, you know, and a lot of people, I mean, that's all you've ever done is it's always been us first. And as a mom, I don't think it always has to be that way, you know, but because you deserve to have time for yourself and do things for yourself, but... Never once have you put us on the back burner for you. Thank you. And one of a question someone asked was, I want to get it right because it really was. Where did it go? How has your perception of being a good mom changed? Mm. <clears throat> How has my perception of being a good mom changed? And I think, too, maybe going from raising kids to raising adults. I think my story is my story's kind of a long, complicated one because I've been raising children for almost 30 years, and I have a nine-year-old. Yeah. So I think you have to look at it that way, that I married a man who had two children that I loved and raised as much as I was able to, and as much as I was given the opportunity to. Yeah. I then had three children. I had two children, you and Chase, 14 months apart, really quick. So by the time I was 24 years old, I was raising four children. Um, and at that time, I don't know, I feel like you were doing all you could. I was doing as good as I knew to do. You know, and my priorities were always my children, always. It was always you guys. Um, so I can say for that, it was, I never, I never thought, I always thought what is the best thing for my kids. You know, mm-hmm. I always, from from the moment that I got pregnant with Chase, I always said, I don't want to do anything to bring shame on my children. And I want to, I want my kids to be able to look at me and know that I was there every day and that I was Mm -hmm. present for them and that I always put their needs before I put my own. And that's been our whole life. Um, You know, and then I had Grayson. And surprise. For those that don't know, Grayson was a legit surprise like tubes tied she had her tubes tied after me i was the last one and then gray came comes along and so he was gonna be a twin y'all let me just tell you that he and the reason he's so big is because he ate his twin in the womb oh my gosh why would you say that because he did oh my gosh. that's why he's so big I'm well convinced. he was twin but you know so i had grayson so i had chase at 23 you at 24 then I had Grayson at 33. 
So I would like to think that I was a better mother at 33 than at 23 because I was older and I had experienced more and I had gone through a lot. Um, and then Chloe came, comes along. Yeah. And now I'm a mother to a nine-year-old. And, and too, for people that are listening, Chloe is my oldest brother's daughter. Right. So mom raised two children that really were not hers, which were Kyle and Lindsay. And then now she's raising Chloe, who she didn't. It's not biologically. She's not biologically no. hers. But she is my daughter. Yes. And, um, you know, I feel like at 49, there are days I feel like I'm way more equipped to handle it. And then there are days I feel like I'm not. Um, but I can tell you that one thing has stayed consistent. And that is that I have loved you guys every single day of your mm -hmm. life and that is stayed true to today with all of you um and I you know I do think it's different when you're raising I, I say raising adult children is the hardest job I've ever had to do and and I think it's hard because from what I see because we are we have lived a different life. We've been on TV. We've made money. We've, and there's been things that, well, if we don't need to come for you, come to you for something, then we have more of an ability to kind of do what we want to do. Right. You know, versus, well, if I do this, then this may happen and I may not get this or that or whatever it may be. And I think being a good parent coming from a kid's point of view because and it may be easy for me to say because growing up we were given a lot you yeah. know but the older I get the more I realize it's not about what your parent gives you it's not about the money it's not about gifts it's not about them just saying yes right I've learned more and have been shown more love through the no's than I have the yeses Right. And, 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 and time. That's the biggest thing is investing absolutely, time. Absolutely. Absolutely. The time. If there's one thing that I could say to, um, a young parent, when you're, when you have two or three toddlers and you're feeling like you don't know how you're going to get through the day, know that this, the days can seem so long, but the years fly by. Mm -hmm. And that is the one thing that it, I, I see it every day. I see it with you guys. Um, but going back to, to raising adult children, you know, I, I've had this conversation so many times, you know, there's a lot of people that feel like, okay, once your child turns 18, they're on their own. They got to figure out life. They got to do what they got to do. And I'm going on with my life now. It's my time. And your dad and I have just never felt that way. Like, we have never felt that way. Yeah. And I've had some really hard conversations with you and with Chase. And and I remember sitting in the car with Chase one day in our garage. And I looked at him. And this hasn't been... He was an adult he, by the world's standards when I had this conversation with him. But I looked over at him and I said, I'm never giving up on you. Mm -hmm. I'm not giving up on you. And I can only be as happy as my saddest child. So I'm never giving up on you. And we're going to get through whatever it is at the time he was going through. I'm going to help you get through it because I'm not giving up on you. So I can't imagine giving up on my kids. Yeah. And I've never had a time in my life to where I felt like I'm alone. You know, like there's... Mm -hmm. When it comes to my parents, oh, granted, I've gone through my anxiety, depression, things I've gone through, but I've known that even if y'all are so fighting mad at something I've done, I have I know I can call you in the middle of the night and you're there. 100%. And that's, and I think 
going from a kid to an adult and our relation. I think there was a big riff at that transition. Right. With me and dad and even me and you because you I went from such a an environment of helicopter parents to then I want to go out on my own all by myself and I want to go complete opposite. And so it took some getting used to for me not wanting to just go complete opposite of how I was raised and right. realizing that I can't like you can be in the middle. Right, right, right. And and everyone goes through that. Everyone mm. does that at some point in their life. We all want to spread our wings and fly. We all want to be independent until we don't. Yeah. You know, we all yeah, want literally. to you know, we all want to be a grown up until we don't want to be a grown up. And, you know, there's times today, I'm 49 years old, that I wish I didn't have to be a grown-up, but I do. Um, and Well, yeah, you know, there's times that I call you of, what do I need to do? I need your help. I need this because I want to be so independent. I want to do all these things on my own until I don't know how to do it. Right. Or until, you know, it was like when I moved out on my own and then Dad and I got into it and we didn't speak for six months. And he was like, you're paying for everything on your own. Good luck, basically. And I say, and it wasn't that I was dating someone for a little while. We broke up and then we got back together. Dad did not like it. Thought I was making the worst decisions. Didn't like how I was living my life. So he was like, fine, if you're going to do that, I don't have to pay for it. Everything is yours. And I remember calling you one day and I was like, and when dad said that, let me preface it by saying, I was like, okay, that's fine. I'll do it all on my own. I don't need you. Like I was, I dug in. Right. And I remember calling you one day. I was like, mom, how do I write a check? <laughs> I was like, they don't teach you these things in school, which right. they should. There yes. should be classes for learning how to do real world things because yes. I lived on my own. I didn't know how to write a check. Yeah. So I wanted to be so independent, but when in reality I didn't have what it took or enough life experience to be able to do it. Right. And so many times our pride won't let us ask for help. Oh, what, that's the biggest issue. That Even to this day, that's my biggest issue is right. I want to prove that I can do it all and I can do it on my own. When in reality, if you let a little bit of pride go, you could probably do it even better. Absolutely. Because you're willing to learn from other people. Yep. And what I would say just as a parent, it is a, it is a learning experience with every child's different. I mean, I'm raising generations of kids, you know, I mean, yeah. Lindsay's 33, Chloe's nine. So yeah. I had, I've got everything in between. So mm -hmm. I think it really is, um, you know, learning and, and knowing that if you truly, I, I pray for my children every single day, mm -hmm. every day of my life, I pray for my kids. And I think if you go into it that way and know that your kids at the end of the day belong to God, we're just given that precious gift for a certain amount of time. You will make mistakes, but you'll get through them and they'll get through them. And yeah. they have to have some reason to go to therapy. <laughs> and to, I think the whole religion thing we're going to get off on in a minute, because I think you're going to be shocked at what I say with that. Okay. But... A question that someone asked, which I love, is what is the hardest part about being my mom? The hardest part about being your mom. <sighs> That's a tough one. Because, <laughs> y'all, I mean, I'm pretty great. <laughs> the hardest part about being your mom. Well, for one thing, you're a lot like your dad. <laughs> But the good thing for you is, is that I have dealt with him for almost 30 years. So I've kind of got that down pat. So I know how to deal with you. The hardest part about being your mom is that I want you to see in you what I see in you. And I want you to realize that sometimes you don't always have to be right. <laughs> And that sometimes you have to truly learn the art of 
letting someone else think they're right. Yeah, that's the pride thing. And putting your pride aside. And that there's so many, though, more positive things than negative things because you're my hustler. You really got a lot of the you got a lot of good things from both of us. You got a lot of bad things from both of us. Like you got your hustle from both of us. Cause yeah. dad and I both will hustle. We will both work. We will both do whatever it is. So you got that from us. Um, you got your kind of hard heartedness from me. Yeah. You know, I, um, that is a, a flaw that I have that unfortunately I passed on to you this hardness, you know, um, which is hard. It's something hard to break through. And I don't even know if it's cause we've talked about trauma and things that we've gone through in life and trauma has a way of just hardening you. Right. And, but I will tell you trauma also has a way of breaking you because the trauma that I've experienced the past few years has broken me in a, in a lot of ways. It has forced me to become emotional in a way that I have never been emotional before. No, y'all, I literally say she will cry at the mailman now. Because it has put things into such a perspective for me. Um, and... So, so I think it can do either, you know, it can, it can harden you or, or, and I, in my case, I think it, it did the opposite. Um, and that does lead into, because obviously, you know, you said the past few years, that's what's broken you. And a lot of questions someone asked, if it's not too painful, can she talk about what's going on now? Right. I'm praying for you all. Right. And all this, the legal issues, you can go to Chrisley Confessions and listen for probably about 50 episodes. Right. And you will have a play-by-play of everything that's been going on. But how you are feeling and handling it, because honestly, you're handling it way better than I am. Mm, I don't know. I don't don't think so. Um, From your... Like, I've never... I've never seen two people, you and dad, like dive so deep into prayer and religion and Christianity and God and be let down, but still keep believing. Like I'm at a point in my life to where, and someone asked me to touch on this because I slightly touched on it in my first episode of, you know, there was, I said, Like, I'm so angry at God. God, Like, if God was real or if God existed, why do you allow bad things to happen? And I've only seen you and Dad dive deeper into it. And Dad said something to me today, and he was like, there have been times to where I've kind of felt like I've, I've been made to feel like you've made fun of me. When I've said, God's spoken to me about this, or like I heard God when he did this, or, right, and that's never my intention is to have someone feel like they were made fun of. Right. I think it just all goes to speak to, you know, Chad and I spoke on it, and it was like, you kind of got to meet people where they're at, and people respond with where they're at in their life. Right. And... That's where I'm at is being so angry because my whole life could change. Right. And I don't mean money. I don't mean. Right. But the two people that I've always had there for me, and that's been my support system and who I've leaned on because I'm there for everyone else. Right. My siblings, my friends, whoever it may be. But I always know I can be there for them because y'all have been there for me. Right. Or you are there for me. Right. So I don't know how I look at y'all and like in the morning, y'all don't answer your phone because you're praying and you're devoting your morning to that and your devotionals. And 
I'm just over here angry. Right. Because it's like, how is a God that's supposed to be so loving and so full of hope? How do you feel so hopeless in it? Right. And I think that's a great question because, listen, there are people listening to this podcast today that everyone has a heart. Everyone has a heart. Everyone has something they're going through. Now, they they may not be going, and I hope to God they're not going through what we're going through. But everyone has a heart. But the one thing that God has said is, I will never leave you and I'll never forsake you. He didn't promise us it was always going to be rainbows and, and sunshine. But he always promised that the rain would eventually stop. And that there may be tears and crying, but that joy comes in the morning. And it's so weird because I don't believe things just happen by chance. I was actually listening to a sermon waiting to come in to, to record with you today. And God knows the when. Nothing catches him by surprise. But God has a way of allowing things to happen in our lives to project us to our destiny, to project us to where where he wants us to be and what our, our true calling is in life. And we're no better than anybody else to go through suffering. We're no better than anybody else to have difficulties in our life. Yes, it's crappy. It's unfair. There's nothing about it that's right or just. But we're no better than the next person to have to deal with it. But we know, he has said, if you lean into me, you will get through to the other side. And you will come through stronger. And when you go through that fire, he has said, we are as of gold. And guess what? Gold doesn't burn, baby. It doesn't burn. He's burning off all the crap around us that he needs us so, so that we can get to where we need to be yeah. so that we can fulfill our destiny. And that may sound preachy, but I believe it in my heart because I have to. I cannot believe that God has brought me this far to drop me off. I cannot believe that God has brought my family that, to this place. I cannot believe that God brought me a little girl who needed me in such a way that he's going to take me away from her. Because I just can't believe that. And I believe that you don't have a testimony without a test. Is this the greatest test I've ever had? Absolutely. And, and to its people are going to, that listen to this, people are going to believe what they want to believe. Whether they believe absolutely. that you and dad did everything you're accused of doing or they don't. Right. That's what they believe. But what I will tell anyone listening to this is do your research. Go online. Pull actual court documents listen listen to both sides and you will see the truth behind it all because I know with the parents that I grew up with and that have taught me the difference between right and wrong that have taught me all the things to do that were constantly saying hey Savannah did I follow up on your taxes make sure that they're paid do this do that you were always instructing me to do the right thing. And you've always taught me to do the right thing, even when it's hard. That's right. And the sad part is, is we're not the first people to be done wrong by, by the justice system. We're not. There's so many people listening. I've had kids reach out to me on social media that, are having to deal with similar things from their parents. Right. One lives right down the street from me in between where I live and Franklin. And her parents are going through all kinds of stuff, reaching out to me. And so when stuff like this happens, it doesn't just affect the people that it's happening to. It affects whole families. It affects kids. It affects because it doesn't matter how old I get. 
like I'm 25, but I'm still a kid. Yeah. Like I still long for my parents. I still, anytime I have a doctor's appointment, I don't feel good. Anything, like I want my mom. And that's been the toughest thing through all of this is just seeing two people who were so good and who have done right by so many people and who have constantly given and... You know, they call dad like the dad of country music because he's the <laughs> he's the dad to so many people yeah. in town that their dads don't step up and yeah. he's always there. And you for all of my friends and you're always stepping up for people. And for me, it makes me so angry to see two people who are constantly stepping up for people. And then it's like, when are people going to step up for them? Well, and two, I'm going to look for a video because you don't know that I took this, nor does dad. Um, but it's just going to go to, and it just came to my mind because it just shows. I, and dad and I'll talk about it, but you know how dad's always had a mouth on him or he's always been so prideful. But this whole thing has broken him. There have been days to where he's come to me crying. He's like, don't tell your mom because I don't want her to go through any more that she's going through. And it's just completely changed him, you. I don't, we've never really spoken about when we went to trial and everything that, you know, during that time, everything, like we said, I don't even remember driving home. Yeah, me either. Like, I remember getting on the phone with attorneys and like I don't I remember walking in my front door and I felt so crazy because I didn't shed a tear literally from the moment you saw I didn't I didn't shed a tear I felt I think I was in such shock and I was like why am I not crying like I should be crying like I know this hurts me why am I not crying and I walk I remember walking in my door and Chad and Holly were standing there waiting on me. And they just, I just fell apart. And they both grabbed me and hugged me. And, you know, Holly, she, once I was sitting there crying, she was like, let's get up. Let me help you get in the shower. She was help, basically like getting me undressed, helping me shower. And I cried then. And then up until basically recently, I haven't. Because I think I've just been in such a mode of trying to work everything away. And I started looking back on things. And, you know, I saw photos that I took. And there was, this was a photo of you and dad that I took that day. And I saw... I think that was what gave me hope was to know that you had two people that love each other so much that it doesn't matter what the outcome is going to be is that we get there yeah. and to see a man have such vulnerability and being able to break. Yes. Cause I've never seen dad that way. Yeah. He was. And I said to him that day, we walked in here together. We're going to walk out together. And we're going to walk through this together. And it was. It was because I have, I've never shared this, but I truly believe that I had a mental breakdown that day. I mean, just like you said, I don't remember. I don't know why in the world I would have ever driven home that day, but I did. I drove your dad and Danny home. I don't remember it. I remember standing in my kitchen, and Jill that works for us was there. And the look of horror on her face, and she says to this day, I'll never forget it, because she said it was like you had died she said there was something about you she said Julie it frightened me so bad when I saw you and that was a 
I truly believe that I I suffered a mental break at that point. Um, And to see you and dad, I remember just thinking, I don't even know if we're going to make it through this. Right. Like, not even through the legal mess, but through where y'all have been mentally. I'm like, I don't know. I don't know if they have it in them to keep fighting. Right. And then I don't know. It was just a switch, I feel like, that flipped in y'all. That, but it know, wasn't Savannah. It was It was. It, and that's what I say is when I go back now and I look at, and it's not until now that it's clicking, but sometimes God allows stuff like this to happen so you realize that that's all that you need. Right. Because there's a video. People can see it as part of our stuff on YouTube. Mm-hmm. But this is a video that I go back so often and watch when I feel like I'm losing hope because it gives me so much. And in that moment, it's dad singing to you worship songs. And it's the biggest testament to me of like, why am I so angry at God when y'all are the two that are going through it? But how y'all can even be at a place now to... Like, that's what Josh's relationship is. Like, it doesn't yeah. matter. Nothing else. And, and you're right. We, we have led into our faith. I, and I believe that no matter what we're going through, I have to try to go through it with strength, with my faith. For you guys to see that. Because if you guys can see me go through something like this and lead into God, it's going to help you down the road because you're going to have hearts. I hope to God you never have anything even remotely close to this. But you chase Savannah. You chase (laughs) Tracy. Savannah's me. Chloe, Lindsay, Kyle, all of you are going to have hearts. And if you can see us go through it and get through to the other side, because we're going to get through to the other side. Now, it may be ugly. It may be ugly, and it may get worse before it gets better. But the one thing I know, and I have to cling to this because this is what keeps me going every day, is to know that I'm going to get through to the other side. And when I do, I will have a greater and already do appreciation for what truly matters in life. And that's God. That is my relationship with him. That is my marriage, my children, my family, my friends. And that is what matters. Everything else can be and gone. So if you guys get nothing from this, that's what I hope you get. Um, You know, and it's easy for people to say, well, God, they found Jesus because they're going through this. No, I've known Jesus my whole life. Now, it's easy to, to, to praise Jesus when things are going great and you're making money and your kids are great and your marriage is great and you're living this wonderful life. Thank you, Jesus, all these blessings. But... When the times get tough, that's when you have to really dig in. That's when you have to live by faith. That's when you have to live by what you know, not what you see. Not what the media says. Not what someone else is saying. But you have to know and live by what you know and what God has promised you. That I'm never going to put more on you than what you can bear. 
that I'm going to be with you and that no matter how dark the day is, like I said, the sun's going to eventually come out. And like I said, I believe that every person listening to this podcast or watching this YouTube, you're going through a hard of some kind. Mm -hmm. Whether it's a relationship, whether your marriage, your, your kids, your job, your finances, your parents, your whatever, an addiction, mental health, whatever it is, we all have our hearts. And my heart to me is, is the hardest thing I've ever done. But your heart and your heart is the hardest thing you've ever done. Yeah. And it doesn't make mine any worse than yours. It's just different. I can tell you that I know God isn't done with our family. I know that this is not the end of the road for us, no matter what it looks like. This is a bump in the road. This is a curve in the road. But I also know that I'm standing with the way maker. And the one who can make oh. my bend straight. And the one who can lift me out of the pit. And I have to cling to that. And no matter what the outcome is, I'm going to continue to cling to it. Because my children are going to see me come out the other side, however it looks, as Still a woman of faith, a mother, a wife, a grandmother, a daughter, a daughter-in-law. And whatever that looks like, I'm going to use it to make a difference. What is, the, in your opinion, how... How do you start working your way out of that anger? For me, it wasn't, for me, it hasn't been as much about anger. And I have to give my parents credit for this because I was raised in church. I was raised in the faith. So for me, it's not as much about anger as it is about fear. And I know that fear comes from the devil. God doesn't put fear in us. So for me, it's about fear. And it's not even fear for myself, but it's fear for my children. It's fear for my parents. It's fear for my mother-in-law because I'm the caregiver. I'm the person who takes care of everyone. Yeah. So my fear is not even for me. It's for them. It's for you. It's for y'all. Uh, and I've asked God to not take the fear away, but get me through the fear. Help me walk through the fear and come out stronger on the other side. It's one of those things. It's, it's kind of like, you know, it was... It, we say like a God thing. The when my podcast first launched, um, Aaron and I were standing here talking, and I remember we were, I was we were literally standing right there, and I was going to walk out, and we were talking about how we hope that my podcast would chart, just be on the charts, didn't care where it was. And I was like, you know what? I'm going to pray for that tonight. Like, I'm going to pray. And Aaron was like, yeah, you go pray to make sure we get on these charts. And I said, actually, you know what? I was like, I'm not going to pray for that. I'm going to pray that God gives me what is mine to have. That's right. And that's where my mind was at. And it was like when it launched, like, we didn't even look at where we were on the charts. Because I was like, part of me, I didn't want to be disappointed and then I looked, and it was just steadily climbing, like right. in all of podcasts and every podcast on the network. I think it got up to 12, maybe, and then number like three in our category. But it was, I've realized that when you, I don't want to pray for something that's not meant for me. Right. 
You're exactly right. Because that's when people say, God doesn't answer my prayer. Well, God doesn't answer your prayer because maybe that's not what he has in store for you. Maybe you're selling yourself short. Maybe he has something much greater for you. Um, but there was something that you also were talking about being angry. And um, I had written something down just from my notes for this past week to stop blaming everything on the events and start making the decisions that God's instructing you. And if you will, if you don't do that, then you'll always be a slave to the events. Yeah. And it brought it me through and, and whether people are biblical or read the Bible or whatever, you know, it was about Joseph and anybody that has read the Bible, been to church, you know about Joseph. Joseph went through 40 years before he realized what God had raised him up to do. And he was thrown in a pit. He was put in prison. He was, Potiphar's wife accused him of rape. His brother sold him. I mean, everything that could happen, happened. But what you have to know is that Joseph went from the pit to the palace, but really he went from pain to purpose, and he went from status to service, and if we would live our life from pain to purpose and from status to service, how much better off we'd be. And it's so crazy that you say that because, you know, I was struggling yesterday, and dad came over and we went on a walk. And everyone looks at our life because we've been on TV of this picture perfect image and our life's great and we don't go through anything and it's funny and you go on nice trips and you, it's TV. Right. And I looked at dad yesterday and I was like, but when, when is our time? Like if we've gone through so much hurt and so much just trauma and all these things like when is it our time like when is enough enough and I was like I'm at that place to where it's like I feel like now's my breaking of like when what do I like what do I do when's enough enough and that's where the angers come from and I don't want anger I don't want to treat people poorly I don't you know there's all these, someone put a comment in when I asked questions for you and they were like, ask her how it is to have raised such a mean girl. I watched it, how you treated Emmy on last night's episode. Well, guess what, y'all? Like, not everything is 110% real, you right. know? Like, right. I don't have an issue with Emmy. I've never, she and I've never had issues. Right. It's, so what you see is not always factual right and real and because I don't live my life to be mean to people no, I don't live I don't that's not the heart that I have but I am going through a phase of life right now to where there is anger and I think that's what I'm trying to work through and a lot of my followers that have asked questions have had that same thing it's like how do you get through the anger how do you still have hope and believe in that and I feel like what you said you Resonate. literally just spoke on all of that of sometimes it takes years sometimes it takes hard after hard after hard for you to finally get your chance right. and one thing that I, I took from just my week of of studying and reading was that and this can be blame and it or blame blame makes sense because it's a b and you'll understand when i say this but it could be <laughs> anger it could be anything but blame will become bitterness and bitterness will become bondage. And I thought, how powerful is that? Yeah. Blame will become bitterness and your bitterness will become your bondage and bondage and guilt and shame are like cancer. They eat away at you. Yeah. And I think Savannah, oh, you, literally that was me yesterday. I think you have to get to a point where, yes, this has been a horrible, traumatic thing that has happened to us. But there's somebody somewhere today 
that they're burying their parent. They're burying their child. They're burying their brother. We're not there. Yeah. We're not there. There's somebody that's been diagnosed today that says there's no hope. We've done everything we can do. There's somebody now that's mourning the loss of a pregnancy, that they've lost their baby. There's somebody that doesn't have a roof over their head or know where their next meal's coming from. So I think you have to put things into perspective and know that without a test, you don't have a testimony. That God gave us this platform and I truly believe that we haven't used the platform in a way that has glorified him and therefore he's shaken us. Mm -hmm. And I think that's, that's been for us all. Yeah. And so I think if, 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 if anyone gets anything from this podcast today is that you can't give up hope can't give up you can't become bitter you can't become angry um because that's not going to help the situation at all yeah and at the end of the day all you have is your faith you have your family and then and, it's all that really and if matters. you're lucky enough to everybody everybody if they ha- if they, they make the choice has has faith has the opportunity to have faith that's your choice to make if you're lucky and blessed enough to have family, you're that much more blessed. Yeah, 100%. So, you know, I think if there's, a, if there's a takeaway from today, it's to show grace to everyone. You know, we're going through our hard. We're going through our hard as a family. as But we're also going through our hard in the public eye. We're going through our hard with people writing things that are untrue. We're going through our hard with people that know one tiny little speck of what's actually going on uh, uh, in something that's huge and complex and has so many parts to it. And they're looking to just misunderstand us. Like they're not looking to try to understand the situation as a whole. Right. They just want to look at it and prey on someone else's downfall. Right. And my thing is, is that I don't care. I don't care how much money you have. I don't care what your status is in the community. I don't care what your job is. I don't care about any of that. People are not going to remember that at the end of the day, Mm -hmm. but they are going to remember how you made them feel. Yeah. And that's the thing is I see people come at us sometimes on social media. I've tried to stay away from the comments. I've tried. But when I see people that just say hateful stuff about you and dad and it's like you don't know these people. You don't know their hearts. You don't know what they've given up for people. You don't know the countless hours they've spent out looking for my older brother you don't know the sleepless hours the the time invested in people like it doesn't matter about the money and what y'all have made and what you've spent it doesn't matter it's and that's what hurts the most is how we live in a society to where people just want to misunderstand people yeah like well, it's they, easy it's it's more salacious to think that we live in a society that love to build people up just to break them down. And we love to, mm-hmm. to, to watch people rise just to watch them fall. Yeah. Rather than be a society where we lift up those who are fallen, we love to stomp them when they're down. And you don't know what someone's going through. You don't know what the person at the grocery store in front of you is going through. You don't know what the person standing in line at the coffee shop is going through. So to, to be on social media and to be just vicious and evil and, and mean is not okay. 
It's not okay to treat people that way. I can tell you that even with, even though in my heart of hearts, I know there have been people that have done me so wrong throughout this whole thing. I pray for those people every day. That's a crazy part to me. I pray for them every day that God blesses them and moves them on. I don't, I can tell you sitting here today, I do not have ill will in my heart toward anybody. And that has only come through God because that is not something that humanly I can no. possibly humanly do. No. But I think just with everything going on in the world today, if we spend as much time lifting someone else up as we did trying to crush them, mm-hmm. this world would be so much better off. Well. Thank you for coming on our podcast today. I love if I say our because it's all a family. Yeah. But no, thank you for coming on my podcast today. And thank you for having me. Just thank you for being the mom that you are, for guiding me, helping me learn because I don't know it all. I need some help from time to time. Well, listen, I'm here no matter what. And whoever said you are a mean girl, I don't usually comment back, but I will comment back to that person because you are not a mean girl. Thank you, Mama. Thank you. Well, I love you. I love you. And thank you for having me.